Okay, so our last event of the day um, is going to be introduced by Melanie Maxson, the Director of Research Support and Outreach Programs at CSSSI. Okay. All right. Well, it's, uh, it's very exciting to be able to introduce the next, uh, the next and final talk at this year's Day of Data. Um, with a demonstration and uh, talk by some of our colleagues at Sci City, the Center, of, Center for Innovative Thinking at Yale. And uh, so our speakers are Martin Weinstein, who is an innovator in residence at the Sci Center for Innovative Thinking at Yale, where he leads the Yale Open Innovation Lab. He is also a research associate in the Yale Department of Electrical Engineering and a research affiliate in the MIT Media Lab. He received his PhD from the University of Melbourne's Australian German Climate and Energy College. He is active in a variety of entrepreneurship projects related to sustainability. And with Martin is Sophie Janaski, who is an Environmental in Innovation Fellow, uh, co-appointed at Sci City and at the Yale Center for Business and the Environment. She works on environmental entrepreneurship at Yale and is a graduate of both Yale College and the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. She's previously served as a fellow with Venture for America, a two-year program that provides training for entrepreneurs. So if things are set up and ready to go, I will turn it over to Martin and Sophie. And I will try not to step on anything and do any damage here. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you so much for uh, everyone for sticking around uh, to listen to us give the, the last talk of the day. Um, we're really excited to be here, and we're very grateful for the invitation. Um, we're going to be setting up uh, some things just at the beginning of this talk, uh, so don't, don't uh, uh, mind the uh, sort of activity at the front of the room. Um, uh, we've got a, a little bit of a VR demonstration that uh, Martine's going to lead uh, at the, the end of the talk. So uh, something uh, exciting to, to uh, keep your attention. <laughs> um, but uh, as I was saying, uh, we're really excited to be here at the Day of Data uh, to share the ways in which uh, we and our students at the Center for Innovative Thinking um, at Yale are engaging with data in entrepreneurial and innovative ways. Um, and in terms of our sort of agenda for the talk, uh, first I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction uh, to Size City, uh, as we call it, um, for those in the room who may not be um, familiar, as we are a relatively new center. Um, so we're just going to give a little bit of context about our, our center and um, some of the programs that, that we're working on. Um, then I'd, I'd be excited to highlight a number of our student um, projects and programs um, uh, who are engaging with data in ways that are particularly relevant uh, for today's theme um, for data on Earth. And then I'm going to actually hand it over to Martine, uh, who's going to talk a little bit more about our labs and initiatives that are being incubated out of Sci City, um, particularly the Open Lab, um, which is doing some really exciting work on emerging technologies and data and uh, applying them to Earth scale challenges, uh, particularly in the energy and climate fields. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we're going to close out with a little bit of a VR demonstration. Um, uh, but as a little bit of background for, for Sci City, just to familiarize, um, launched in the fall of 2015, Sci City is building a new center of gravity for students, faculty, and alumni uh, to collaborate more effectively across disciplines, endeavors, and ways of thinking. Um, about the world generally. So our core commitments are to interdisciplinary collaboration, uh, inclusion across every dimension of diversity, the conviction that we can turn rigorous thought and creativity into effective action, uh, and the fostering of resilience. And one of the main ways in which we do this is via programming. So this is sort of a high level overview of a number of the different uh, types of programming that we've been experimenting with over the past year uh, and a half now. Um, and so we, again, offer a number of ways to explore and engage with tons of different topics. So there are folks who are working on, um, you know, coming from all across campus, uh, all different disciplines, all different backgrounds, working together on teams. Um, and I want to take a moment to sort of walk through uh, some examples of teams who are um, specifically engaging with data. So we see this um, a lot in our sort of like more learning and building oriented uh, activities. Um, and uh, so in terms of highlighting those, I'm going to start with 
build. And so what we mean when we say build is when um, uh, our programs that are guiding students and teams with innovative ideas uh, through the process of actually building out organizations, projects, ventures. Um, we provide support through workshop, mentoring, funding, those types of things. Um, but again, we're not strictly focused on just for-profit ventures. We are focused sort of across the board, um, although I think both of the, the teams I'm going to highlight right now are actually for-profit ventures. Um, so the first team I want to highlight is part of our, uh, was, was part of our uh, 2018 Fall Accelerator. Um, so this was a six week program um, that uh, ran co-curricularly, so full time students were, were in this program and were giving up um, their Fridays to, to sort of work on their, on their projects. Um, and this team is called Briomix. Uh, they're a team of four graduate biology PhDs. Um, and their innovation is to use DNA sequencing data and analysis uh, to help farmers make smarter decisions regarding their crop choice, irrigation, fertilization, and the uh, application of microbial inoculants. So the, their vision here is that um, the data that they collect and, and analyze and synthesize and sort of provide tailored insights around uh, is going to be useful in developing new advanced microbial inoculants. Um, so for example, if the DNA sequencing revealed that a, a, a field lacked a particular uh, beneficial you know, set of beneficial microbes, um, that they could make a tailor-made recommendation um, on which microorganisms needed to be applied to the field. Um, so this is a really exciting example of um, uh, a team sort of taking their expertise in genetics and biology and, and thinking about um, how to synthesize with that with data to, to uh, apply in sort of an entrepreneurial context. Um, the next team I want to quickly highlight came out of our summer fellowship. So this was a full-time uh, I believe it was a 10-week program, or 8 to 10 weeks, uh, where students uh, were working uh, over the summer to, uh, on different uh, entrepreneurial ventures and projects. Uh, and this team is called Visionary Health. It's co-founded by a student at the, the Yale uh, Public Health School. Uh, and they're developing artificial intelligence powered solutions to make healthcare delivery less expensive and more reliable. So it's actually really interesting that I think one of the earlier talks was sort of alluding to, to these types of solutions. Um, so we have one of our students who's actively working on, on building that out. Uh, so they're uh, essentially building uh, an automated image screening platform um, which is capable of autonomously examining uh, medical images with the idea being that um, they can effectively uh, identify which images um, are, you know, have the potential for having abnormalities um, so that radiologists can really focus on those and sort of the, the images that are most clinically, uh, clinically relevant. Um, so some really exciting work being done uh, on that front. And so the next set of programming I kind of want to uh, touch on is our um, sort of more learning-oriented programming. So uh, not all students are coming in whizzes at sort of deep learning techniques or uh, genetic, um, you know, genomic sequencing. Um, but we have students who are really interested um, in taking, um, you know, perhaps some of their more uh, humanistic backgrounds or liberal arts knowledge um, and trying to... Uh, learn technical skills and be able to sort of mesh the two together. Um, and that's something that we're really, really particularly exciting about is getting these people who are really deeply involved or have a, a deep set of expertise um, and how might we be able to uh, uh, you know, provide opportunities for learning uh, to apply a new skills to, to, to that knowledge base. And so uh, one of the programs I'd love to highlight is an Internet of Things intensive. So um, SciCity runs intensives, uh, which are essentially co-curricular deep dives into topics um, that, that students are interested in. Oftentimes these last four to six weeks, meeting once a week um, for you know, two to three hours at a time. And so this Internet of Things intensive, uh, students explored the interconnections um, via the internet of different computing devices uh, that are embedded in everyday objects that you know, send and receive data. 
And so this was led by our mentor in residence, Levi DeLuke, who's actually a Yale College graduate, um, who taught some of the basics of the theory, best practices, examples of different uh, IUT system design, and then teams actually formed and, and, and students worked on projects um, that included integrating sensors, data processing, wireless communications, and outputs um, you know, over the course of, of, of the intensive. Um, and one of the teams that I'd, I'd like to highlight on this front um, is one that we were actually very excited about because it came out of a, a specific request from the city of New Haven. So it um, was a really um, amazing way to engage with some of the local expertise here. Um, they needed a way to detect the water level inside storm systems um, in order to collect some data that was really important for some of their, their city models. Um, and some of the existing commercial products just weren't weren't meeting their needs. So they, they partnered with one of the teams in this intensive uh, to develop a prototype of an IoT device uh, that takes an analog voltage reading from a sensor, encodes it so that it can be sent efficiently over our long range data uh, communication channel, and then is processed, saved on a server, and that's ex accessible to, to um, the, the, the folks who are needing it for, for their modeling. So that was sort of a really um, exciting uh, application that um, uh, some of our students got to, you know, learn some brand new stuff and, and immediately apply it. Uh, and then lastly, um, I want to just, as a quick note, highlight, um, I don't have necessarily any students specific projects to highlight from this effort, but um, uh, blockchain was mentioned earlier, I think, in the last talk, so I uh, thought I'd give a little bit of a shout out here too. Uh, so at the end of September, we hosted a uh, two-day blockchain boot camp. Um, that had over 125 participants hosted up in Kroon Hall, um, three panel discussions and two tracks. So the, the, the real goal of this blockchain boot camp um, was uh, to teach participants and sort of jumpstart uh, their technical skill building uh, in blockchain development via hands-on training. We had a, a, a two pedagogical partners from you know, Consensus Academy, Byte Academy, uh, coming to lead workshops at different levels um, for students who um, you know, were interested in uh, building out some of those skill sets. And uh, moving forward, we're excited to continue some of um, uh, continue some of these approaches. I think uh, we got feedback that students found this really valuable. Um, and it was really exciting for me, for, for me to hear in some of the previous talks, some of the skills that uh, um, we're looking to, to sort of build up on campus. So um, if there's any room for collaboration on that front, we'd be really excited about it. Um, and with that, um, I would love to hand it over now to Martine Weinstein, who's gonna give you a little bit more of a background um, on some of our labs and initiatives, and then sit tight for the, the VR demonstration. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for, uh, for hosting us. It's amazing that we're finally here, uh, being that we've been talking about day of data since early in the semester. So, um, And we've, we've also discussed the possibility of running this demo that I'll just explain a bit of what's happening. Um, Bobby Berry here is uh, actually one of the students uh, very much engaged um, with us and, and has also been part of a, an intensive, like Sophie explained, around virtual reality. And so. What we're doing is just calibrating the sensors from these two towers. Um, and, and I'm explaining that because this will happen over the last part of the talk. Um, I will also try to see if I can... Oh, I think we lost the USB that connects to this. So the clicker won't work. Um, so, so once that... Is it done? Amazing. Once the, oh! <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah, I mean, it looks just like a, like a, a, a data USB. <laughs> um, so a lot of what Sophie explained relates to our semester-long programs. You know, we're very much student-facing, uh, but this year we also tried to consolidate uh, longer-term programs uh, for students to participate beyond a semester. And, and we call those our, our labs and our initiatives. Um, we, we have currently three main labs and initiatives. The Knowledge Equity Initiative is led by um, um, World Fellow Baljeet Sandhu and focuses on being able to value in a meaningful and equitable way um, 
learnings from lived experiences from social uh, change makers. Um, we at Yale is, is an amazing uh, campus-wide series, very well established, to showcase uh, and inspire women entrepreneurship. Um, and what I'll talk about today uh, is the Open Innovation Lab, uh, which yeah, I'll showcase three projects that are particularly relevant around, around data and earth. Uh, so we thought it was, it was, it was uh, relevant for this. And, and the, the logic of the Open Lab in many ways is to try to leverage radical collaboration uh, for disruptive projects that we can incubate uh, and get students to participate on that involve multi-stakeholder uh, partnerships in, in two uh, main uh, uh, intersection between large earth system challenges and emerging technology. Uh, in terms of earth system challenges, our focus has mostly been through the last year and probably at least one more year on climate and energy transition and, and the, the Paris Agreement and what can we do around this topic. And in terms of emerging technology, one of the key things um, that wouldn't be a surprise is blockchain because um, part of our perhaps intuition among the series of uh, uh, emerging tech is that it might be able to develop uh, innovative governance uh, structures for collaboration to happen. And even though we'll also talk about VR, we also have kind of on, on the side how to be able to bring in open source crowd content development in VR using, using blockchain. So in this sort of three intersection uh, points comes opportunities using some system thinking to see what are leverage points that disruptive projects can emerge uh, in the context of, of open innovation, meaning that everything we do uh, is published either, either creative commons or open source licenses um, for also the world to share and replicate. Um, and, and within that project track, there's three things that I want to highlight today. Uh, one is a project that we're working on how to use blockchain to finance solar systems. Uh, another one is, is, is a new project we're calling Open Earth Collabathons. Um, and finally, the Energy Academy, where we're going to deep dive into, into VR. Now, these three projects are tied also to our also semester-long programs. In the case of, of Blockchain for Smart Solar Finance, we do a working group. We meet every Thursday on the CID. Um, the, the collabathons are, are open, open events that anyone can join. And for VR, we, we did run an intensive this semester. And I also i am going to highlight specific things about these projects relative to data rather than going into uh, each one in full detail because they are kind of like worlds on, on their own. Um, and, I, and I will start with, with the one on the left. And one of the probably the key things that you, you might bring out of that is, is that each project always tries to have uh, a collaboration with both inside Yale and, out, and outside um, uh, partnerships. So that's, that's in many ways a, an ethos of city is to be a glue of, of many multidisciplinary centers already at Yale. Um, so well, the first project um, where we're doing research and development on how to use blockchain for finance is actually uh, inspired by uh, Hurricane Maria when it hit Puerto Rico uh, in September last year. Um, leaving the, or exposing the vulnerability of the energy system. And this is a project that started at the Digital Currency Initiative at the MIT Media Lab, and then we've been leading it since February in partnership with them. And also led us to collaborate with the Innovation Office of Puerto Rico, very interested in this, in this project. Um, in a nutshell, one of the key things that we're trying to uh, test and develop is um, take solar assets, to say solar panels that are, you know, they can be financed and use, again, Internet of Things uh, data, so sensors, uh, power meters that are connected to the Internet and broadcast them to smart contracts on a blockchain. Now, a blockchain is a decentralized ledger where, in, in many ways, the particularity is that no one has total control of, of, over that information, but at the same time, everyone has to have consensus of what's in there. A smart contract is, let's say, a piece of code that lives on a blockchain and executes actions or transactions between, uh, between peers if certain uh, variables are, uh, or agreements are actually met. And so it does it automatically. Therefore, if we put kind of these, the, the IoT data and the smart contract concept, 
what we're able to execute automatically, for example, is payments, uh, a tariff, a price per kilowatt hour, um, uh, certificates of carbon, of, of renewable energy that was generated. And in many ways, a blockchain is a, a decentralized temp stamping system of what just happened. So it's like, this just happened, this ener renewable energy was generated, this carbon was displaced. Um, and this has led us to propose uh, financial mechanisms to even leverage, for example, municipal bonds to transform Puerto Rico's 800 public schools into be solar-powered emergency shelters. Uh, taking a lot, so in parallel to this project, we said, well, why don't we, we also test some things here at home? And so one of the things that we've been doing um, is, is trying to think about how we can take the renewable energy assets here at, um, at Yale and use these proof of concepts to, to uh, also produce certificates of the carbon that is displaced, for example, from the solar panels at Kroon Hall or the wind turbines and the, at the Beckton building. And just last week, a couple of students finished the electronics uh, on one of, uh, of the um, uh, printed circuit board for, for those IoT uh, power meters. And I think next week we're going to be already putting this together in, in Kroon Hall and, st and started to even think about how, how we can transact almost carbon value between, between buildings. Let me go to the next um, um, uh, project that is also quite new, and it's also around um, blockchain and data consensus. So the, what the mission that inspires this project is, is, the, is one of the major challenges that comes out of the Paris Agreement. Um, having a 1.5 degree temperature target implies that we really have a physical limit in our atmosphere, and, and that is our single planetary carbon budget. And, and in many ways, a single budget almost requires a, a single ledger to keep track of it. And so our hypothesis is, well, can we leverage blockchain's decentralized consensus and, and record-keeping abilities and apply it to, um, to tracking uh, between parties that, as we know, don't necessarily trust each other because there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, vested interest in being able to emit more in, in, in that quota. Um, and so with that in mind, which is definitely not an easy thing to do and, 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 and not something to do overnight, what we think about is, well, why don't we do a, a series of collaborative hackathons that build on each other, uh, and, and we start by, by starting to explore pieces of the puzzle towards being able to have almost like an Earth carbon ledger. Um, and so we start with data, data oracles, which I'll explain soon, and then going into climate action tracking, for example, by non-state actors. Let's say New Haven wants to be carbon neutral by 2045, and, and there has to be a record of that and ways of tracking that. Uh, so these are all things that also lead up to some of the capabilities that would be needing for something like that, and then eventually um, uh, we, we could conceive of, of working on an on a Earth carbon ledger that would be probably very useful for the UNFCCC, for example. Um, before going into data oracles, this is how we've conceived this concept of, of, a, of a collabathon. It starts with a design sprint. Uh, multiple experts coming together and, and understanding the problem, even thinking or reframing the problem, uh, ideating, deciding on, on a prompt or a technical architecture of something that then will move towards more like a, a, an open source product sprint that involves a collaborative uh, coding contest. Uh, think about a hackathon where in a hackathon everyone is working on their code and, and, and the winner takes all in a competition to a running code that everyone sees and, and every time you improve something about the code, you take a leading board. So this is something that was uh, worked a lot by, by MathWorks that develops MATLAB and we've been, we've been in, uh, we're working with them on trying to develop something like that. We think something, something like this might be also be interesting on how to work on collective global problems in a collaborative way. So I'm gonna go to just uh, what we're running next week. Clearly it's our first design sprint. This was very initial steps. Uh, and it's not very similar, not very different from what I explained in the Puerto Rico case where we have solar assets, um, IoT data, and smart contracts. Um, what data oracles uh, do on a, on, a, on a blockchain smart contract is sit right there in between. Let's say we have a bet to what's the price of oil in the next coming months and, and there's some money and that someone has to verify that that was met or not. So normally the way we'd go is to a banking or a trusted institution that is going to attest about what happened in the future or maybe in the past. So if you have smart digitalized contracts, 
you need almost like a trusted oracle, which is a, almost like a, an abstract computer that's going to attest to something and then verify it to the, the smart contract. And in many ways, what we're trying to work on, on that concept is uh, how do we do that to attest on the marginal carbon uh, displaced per unit of, of new clean energy? Um, because if eventually a, a ledger that keeps track of a carbon budget needs to be executed like records through a, a, almost a, a contract. And so this is an area, and I'm not going to go into the, the details of it, but we're, we're excited about what comes, comes after, after our first design sprint. So with that, we're going to go even <laughs> deeper into the virtual world, um, into a project that we've started incubating um, in this summer, actually, around July, called the Energy Academy. And we're, we've been incubating this with the Center for Collaborative Arts and Media. Um, um, so in, in many sense, it's only, what I'm going to show you has only, it's only been since the summer, and it kind of tacitly suggests how fast it is to develop in, in, in the world of mixed reality. I don't want to talk too much before we, we jump into a demo, uh, because it, it should be kind of self-explanatory, but there's a couple of remarks that I wanted to do. Uh, the first is... It, this might be common for some people, but I just want to make, make a clear distinction. When we talk about mixed reality, there's almost like a, a family term that has both virtual reality and augmented reality. Virtual reality, its characteristic is it's a fully immersive environment, and there's two ways of, of experiencing mixed rea uh, virtual reality is through a phone-based headset or a fully computer-connected headset like an HTC Vive that's that's there and has sensors and has to be connected to a computer that has a large uh, graphical processing unit. At least that's how we know the technology today. I mean, it's, it's changing very fast. Augmented reality superimposes the three, 3D digital world on our real world, so it's a lot more interactive. I can see you, uh, as you will see when I put on the headset, I, I, I'll stop seeing you and, and, and you might leave the room and I won't even find out. <laughs> um, augmented reality has a lot of applications, but one of the things that um, we also find is that developing in VR really helps us think on applications for AR. Um, the second thing I wanted to say is one of the things that inspired this project was a big picture concept of how energy flows through planet Earth through a, a, a large Sankey diagram that the Global Carbon Energy Program at Stanford developed. And, and when I saw this uh, maybe t 10 years ago, um, I said, wouldn't it be nice to turn these into visual journeys, at least if we just focus on solar energy and how it flows through planet Earth, so that we decant a large Sankey diagram into journeys that one can um, understand you know, how, it, how energy connects us all in many ways in, in, in space and time, and particularly being able to test whether we can uh, bring in contact through, through scale, through, through nested uh, systems and scales, and so I'll, I'll try to show a bit of what are our first prototypes around this. Um, and it, because it, like the, the concept was uh, so varied of being able to understand how energy flows through planet Earth, to say, well, let's build a, 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 a whole campus for it, and each dome will have its own experience. And the, the next thing I wanted to actually um, uh, also explain is that I loaded into one of the domes uh, a project that we just finished, uh, also it was like two, three months, working with Avangrid, the, the utility owner and operator. They own uh, United Illuminating and they're themselves owned by Iberdrola, uh, where we explored how to use you know, mixed reality, both VR and AR, on how to give more intuitive tools for interacting with the data of, of transmission lines for operators that are just... Uh, uh, at least the ones that manage this part of the grid are just a, a couple of uh, exits away from the freeway. And so we've been working with them and trying to think about some of these new applications and, and getting students involved in that was, was, was been great. So I'm just clarifying that when I'll, I'll go into the, the, um, the last part of the demo, you understand where that comes from. Um, hmm. Without further ado, um, I will put on a headset. I'm, I'm gonna see if this lab is working. Yeah. Um, uh, and I, I will change source to laptop. How are we doing on time? Um, we have about let's see, fifteen minutes. Oh, good. I don't. I don't want to. I, I don't want to get lost in virtual world and then <laughs> literally take it off and you guys are all gone. And <laughs> it's my worst night. Worst nightmare, I think. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll put on this headset and 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 I'll take mostly the role of. Um, 
a tour guide. Um, and you will notice th this is not data intensive. Um, we can think of it almost as a canvas for where your work, your data could be showcased. Um, so it's more around uh, perhaps inspiring us uh, how, do we, how do we turn a lot of the concepts uh, that we talked about today and, and turn them into immersive environments uh, or data in context, in, it, in, its, in its real context. Let me turn, put on, turn on these controllers. And all right, we're, we're in, inside our first geodesic dome which we call almost the Earth Campus Headquarter. Um, and since we are, we've been talking about data on Earth, wouldn't it be amazing to be able to interact and see uh, information about our, our beautiful planet in, in, a, in a more immersive and, uh, and contextualized environment? Uh, some things that we think about is, well, well, what are some of the topics that we'd like to explain that perhaps diagrams that are key, key things that we need to learn about how temperature is rising in our planet, but, but, but testing it in, in more 3D, uh, 3D models, or even understanding planetary boundaries in, in, a, in a more 3D setting. And as you see here, we're in the main ring of this uh, Energy Academy campus. Uh, again, think about each dome almost like a chapter in a book uh, or in a textbook. I'm going to head over to our Energy Observatory, um, where I, I'm so excited about being here after we just had, we just heard Jesse Sosowski uh, talk about uh, planets. And so this, these are you know, our, our, our planets in, in, uh, in relation to themselves in terms of size, not in terms of distance, because they just did, literally didn't fit into our dome. Um, but if we really want to contextualize this, we should literally just, you know, take us up in, in, into the sun. And so the dome fades, and, and now we're, we're looking at the, at the Milky Way galaxy. And I'm wondering if I just walk that way, whether I'll find exo, exoplanets. Um, but but uh, he, here it is. I mean, if we think about how, how can we conceive about uh, explaining some physics of, of our sun, uh, these are some of our first tests of, 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 of thinking about whether this is a, 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 new, a way to engage our, our modern classrooms. Uh, or even so to educate data science, but also to show the outputs of, of our work. Uh, one of the key parts, if, if you remember that Sankey diagram, is understanding the flow of solar energy towards planet Earth that, that in this case, is to scale, and that's why we, we can't really see it. Um, we've, we've tested interacting with different parts of information. For example, if we wanted to learn about the chemical composition of, of the sun or, or the physics, so we understand how proton-proton fusion produces uh, the photons that travel, or I can bring up my magnifying glass and look at the subatomic photons already committing in their 150 uh, uh, million kilometers towards planet Earth, uh, a trip that will we'll stop halfway there between the sun and, and planet Earth, to think about, again, that those 162,000 uh, terawatts of, of solar um, energy in flux, in constant flux, and, and this is a, uh, a way that we can perhaps uh, manipulate the sizes uh, that, uh, that then transform into uh, all those different journeys, which are actually not that many. Most of it you know, gets reflected and goes back to space. Part of it gets absorbed by air and turns into wind. Uh, a, a very small but important part is photosynthesis, evaporation of water, or hydro cycle, uh, surface heating. So we, we conceive of this kind of like uh, exergy flux model uh, as, a, as a menu also for content of, of understanding the, the dynamic between our planet and, and, and the star of, of the show, really. Um, so for example, let's, we, we look at perhaps a lot of the physics that can happen here, uh, but if we want to look at the biological part, uh, this will take us to another dome where uh, the focus is on, on the photosynthetic uh, metabolism, uh, and this dome is, is focused, it's called our terrarium, um, on, on diving deep into the, the biological world. And the way to do that and explore a lot of that cross-scale uh, navigation of content, we placed a, a leaf inside this microscope. Um, 
So I'm, I'm literally going to go into the microscope. And now I'm standing on that leaf um, inside the dome. And perhaps this is a, a, a nicer setting to learn about. For me, one of the most important uh, uh, metabolic equations that we've learned since elementary school. Uh, and, and, and even perhaps I can bring up my magnifying glass and see uh, in, into the cell. Or um, even better, I, we've, we've, we've tested here how to be able to go even further across scale. So I'm, I'm going to take a trip down into the leaf. Think about how each of these settings can also bring the story about uh, the outputs of, of your research or your work or, or what you're um, explaining. We're, we're here at the, at the leaf tissue and looking at cells, and, and we can dive even into a chloroplast in, in, in this model. So let's scale into the chloroplast, into the thylakoid membrane, where photosynthesis um, happens, where that solar energy gets, gets transformed into uh, what runs most of our biological system. Diving into the thylakoid membrane, here we placed almost a model that is very typical in our textbooks, uh, uh, photosystem 2, photosystem 1, ATPase. Uh, and, and, and here the question is, can we, can we explain a lot of these critical pathways, photons from the sun triggering electron excitation, the electron transport chain to produce ATP into a more immersive context? Um, so um, we're, we're definitely very excited on testing this with, with uh, professors, faculty that are, that are in whatever field they are on, on how we can use VR, uh, both for edtech but also to showcase um, results in a, in a very tangible way. I'm going to head back up into the leaf and then go into campus. So this will take me back into the terrarium. How are we doing? Are you guys still in the room? <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, and and if, if we understand some of the basics of solar energy and the role that the biological system has in, in, in introducing it into the trophic system, spiral timeline here is a, is a work in progress on how do we able to navigate through, uh, through time from the moment we are now uh, to the birth of the Earth, uh, to the moment of the Big Bang. Uh, there's, there's not much content there, too, but I just wanted to show you um, some of our ideas. And, and one of the key things is also understanding how do we transition our economy into a, a solar-based economy. Um, and, and the electrical power system has a key role in that. So in our power grid observatory is where we nested a lot of the outputs of our work with Avangrid. Um, we placed a, a map navigator where we can interact through geographical scales in 2D. And uh, the transmission system of, um, of New England so that we can think about augmented reality applications and a place to load uh, physical devices. So this is, for example, the operations of Avangrid in all of the United States. And I noticed that Oklahoma didn't have any wind farms, so we popped up this distributed energy resource palette so that we can propose to them that perhaps we could have a couple of wind farms there, too. Um, so this is perhaps the more, more interactive part of the data that we've, we've tested. And again, cross-scale uh, understanding is a key part of this project. So we just look at country operations. We can go into regional network, which of course is uh, where we are. That's, that's New Haven. Um, right, right around New Haven, there's the, the town of Woodbridge, and we wanted to showcase a specific microgrid um, there that, uh, that I'll zoom into that. But these are just some of the the wind farms that are close by. So if we go into the transmission system, um, we're getting closer to the area where Woodbridge um, is. And these are, this is a specific substation. And we, this more relates to how we can interact with transmission lines and, and see their outputs visualized in a, in, a, in a more perhaps intuitive way into the actual distribution system. Now we have the Amity High School, which is, which is in, in, in Woodbridge. And after uh, Hurricane Sandy, they placed a fuel cell and turned this whole section with um, the town hall, the police station, the fire station into a microgrid so that it increases the resilience of this you know, first responders in the case of, of another superstorm. Uh, but the, then again, why not add some efficiency to the fire station? Uh, and think about distributed energy resource management, maybe a, maybe a power pack so that we can do a bit of arbitrage with batteries. Um, and 
maybe heading over to the school and on top of the fuel cell, I'll add some solar. Um, so a lot of the, this, this information is also showing some of the key outputs of the micro in terms of generation and, and consumption uh, and how to improve the portfolio of, of devices. In this area, we looked mostly at the role of an operator that looks at the transmission line 24-7 almost uh, and, and inspecting different alarms and pop-ups that happen of, again, Internet um, of Thing devices, so devices that are in the electrical power system. So we developed here a concept of a scenario generator, so I'll press on that, and this is what often an operator sees a series of a, a Christmas tree of alarms. Each alarm is related to a sensor. Something happened. Uh, in this case, the scenario produces a surge loss in a specific area of the power system. And so we suggested to them, why don't we use machine learning to process a lot of our historical alarms to turn it into more acute diagnostic, remove the noise, focus specifically where the critical alarm is so that a system can even output to the operator what happened uh, a thunder strike with 80% confidence hit the insulator of a transmission tower and bring in that, that data through, for example, an augmented reality headset to the operator. Um, and there's, I think, maybe a couple of other scenarios we worked on, for example, uh, something around the renewable, uh, the, the regional network and the renewable scale, for example, the wind farm producing a system function alarm from one of the sensors uh, bringing in, again our diagnostic and literally say, well, what's the sensor? What's happening? This is, this is a problem. I, I don't see any alarm here, but perhaps there's a specific sensor that is showing here. A main generator bearing is, uh, is, is sending a signal. And so perhaps uh, uh, we could send an engineering report directly to, a, to an engineer on the field. These are some of the things that we, we've been testing. Let me, let me think about another place to take you. But I think that's, that's, that's most of the things I wanted to show. The web of science is as a mere pl placeholder of what we eventually think about the content of, of a project like this should be able to uh, keep track of all the, the facts or, or the, the citations that are used to compile uh, visualized data. And so uh, eventually one of the things we, we conceive is being able to load, for example, uh, bibliographic network diagrams. And this will take us back to our, our our Earth. Whew. Well, you're still here. <laughs> um, I just wanted to iterate that that it's it's almost like an invitation for how can this inspire us on 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 how relatively easy it is to manage the the 3D virtual world. Uh, both VR and AR use very similar development platforms. So if you have something that you want to show that you want to, uh, both on your research or one, something you want to learn, these might be interesting tools to, to consider. Well, thank you. I think that we have one uh, time to, for one to two questions okay. before we close. I thought there was like, someone behind me. Um, so first of all, I didn't know this place existed. This is wonderful. <laughs> Wait, which one? The virtual the world? Innovation <laughs> Thinking Center. Yeah, it's also. Oh, uh, thank you for helping me find it. Um, but also, this whole virtual reality thing. I mean, it, it looks really cool to me. But to me, um, ultimately, visualization is storytelling. And I'm wondering, what does VR bring to storytelling? And what are the use cases where if you could see things in three dimensions, it's actually going to illustrate or, or give us insights into data that we can't, that can't be rendered in, in two dimensions or in tra with traditional means? Yes. Um, I think storytelling is, is probably one of the most powerful things for VR. Um, at least one of the things that inspired to explore uh, this issue through the lens of, of, of climate change um, and, and our relationship with our, with our planet is that most of the things that, you know, at, at the core of maybe, 
you know, obviously this is a topic that everyone can think about what's the, what's the fundamental problem, why our civilization is driving itself out of the planet. Or, and, and, um, and I think part of that is uh, we still lack the degree of, of consciousness or awareness of that we are not separate to it, we are an extension of it, we're part of it, um, and we're strictly interdependent to that. And so in many ways, reframing that to bring, bring through education, through higher degrees of awareness, a reframing of the storytelling in our relationship with our planet perhaps is the key thing for us to understand that the car I drive or whatever my footprint is has an impact in multiple scales and multiple layers. Um, that's what I guess I, I can say to, to that. I, although I, I wasn't sure if there was a specific question. Uh, the question I, I guess it's just if I can see certain data in three dimensions, mm -hmm. Yeah, gotcha. Um, so I, I can't say I, I can answer that that question because I think it requires a lot of a lot of testing and research into basically the the education or the pedagogical um, concept of it. Most things that if you have like data in three dimensional um, aspect. You can navigate in, in, in your 2D uh, software relatively well. Um, I think that perhaps this allows, um, and also depends on how everyone's neurolinguistic programming works on what, how they remember things. And if, if a little you put you inside, will we'll perhaps, in the, in the context, perhaps that relates you to the, when many times when people uh, stand in, in the, the, the solar scene, they don't really care about the sun. They just look at the Milky Way and they're like, thank you for letting me be here. And it's, it brings up their emotions, and they remember things, and, right? So, so how, do we, how do we tie this into a, our pedagogical process? Can it consolidate better how we understand and graph that, that 3D data set? Perhaps we, we see this as a tool, and that those, apparently like, this like, is, this is an interesting, cool tool. Some things that might be working, and, and many times it's like, well, you know, for example, with, with Avangrid, they, 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 they were like, well, if, if we know the output of where the problem is, we can use augmented reality to tell the operator to go to the place where the situation is. And I say, why don't you just use Google Maps, right? So, so it, it springs a lot, of, a lot of thought, like, oh, we could do this and that. But, and we, we, this is what happens with emerging technology. We have to test because the, the spectrum of where it's useful and where it's not and with blockchain, I can talk for, for a while, and let's blockchainify this and, and this. And so it's still part of the research of, of trying where, where it fits. I have a question, so that got me thinking. Um, I feel like the transition from coding to GUI interfaces actually eroded people's ability to think computationally and sort of problem solving. It made things, and what's your experience with this you know, this is almost like GUI on steroids, if I'm thinking about it right. And how do we connect that back to actually the ability to sequence problems and sort of the, the intellectual, analytical chops that get built when you actually have to go in through like a command line interface or code something up? Yeah, yeah, um, thanks. And, and, and I, I, I had a slide that I didn't, that didn't show, because in some sense I, I tried to also explain where, where we think this fits in a software stack is just the graphical user interface. Uh, it just allows um, that if you're working with big data or machine learning or blockchain, it, the interface is not intuitive. And so it also limits uh, who we can reach with this information. Um, it reminds me of um, uh, what's that, that program that you know, CS50 starts with um, that you just use blocks to learn how to code. It's developed by the, actually the MIT Media Lab. I remember using it and, and it's a great success because it's like people understand how to run code using just this, this piece into here. Um, it w is the question is can we learn how to code in VR? Maybe, I, I, but, um, but I think it, it's tied a bit to uh, um, the previous question is, is can we use this to First, approach, approach newer audiences uh, that perhaps won't engage to a piece of information in a way that it's, you know, through an immersive uh, context might, might relate a bit more. Um, and then perhaps think 
that if, if you're able to frame the story, uh, for example, in, an, in a planetary problem, uh, that is, uh, and, and there's a lot of work in VR, for example, for, for large social issues, um, uh, human trafficking, you, you can conceive how we can you know, elicit empathy through VR. To then say, well, I really need to learn how to code to solve this problem. <laughs> Uh, this is related to the blockchain. Um, even when you're running like a non-Bitcoin operation, you still need some kind of mining operation to be able to generate the ciphers. So uh, what do you see the entities of uh, controlling those, those mining operations mm. when you don't have a financial incentive like you do with uh, mm. Bitcoin operations? Yeah, yeah um, and it's, it's interesting because in the work of the intersection of blockchain and energy, there's, there's naturally the, the huge elephant in the room saying, hey, Bitcoin's carbon footprint is terrible. Um, and my answer tends to be, well, first, Bitcoin is an experiment that got out of hand. It was not designed for, for uh, what mining rigs use now. It's designed to be run on a graphical processing unit and then went, or actually on a CPU, and then went into, well, let's use gaming graphical processing units for this. And then go to application-specific uh, integrated circuits, which is what mining rigs do. So it's changing on a technological level, and it just shows a bit of uh, different incentives there. Uh, it's our responsibility to, to turn it into safer protocols in terms of carbon footprint. It's not the only uh, protocol out there. Uh, Bitcoin uses a protocol that uses proof of work to, to deal with the consensus process of, a, of an entry in, in a registry. Um, there's, there's Byzantine fault tolerance. Um, we started, we're starting to work more a bit with Stellar, which is more of a fintech network and uses a federated Byzantine fault tolerance system, uh, lower carbon footprint. Um, it, because we've, we've, we've already finished our cycle of hype and blockchain, so I think it's almost like now, it's like, oh, maybe it doesn't work for everything. Um, so there are things, and a lot of research has been going out there to, to solve that. I don't know if that... Okay, so um, let's thank our speakers again. Thank you.